everyone, welcome to another episode of Don't Shit on the Bus. I am your host, Adam Elmacias, tuning in all the way from Los Angeles, California, for episode number 65 with Lucas Keller of Milk and Honey. Now, Lucas Keller is a very, very old friend of mine, and I'm not saying he's an old guy. He's not. He's full of youth and life, but I've known him for a long time. I actually met Lucas when I was in high school in Madison, Wisconsin, I forget who actually introduced us. I think it was through a band. I think it was Just Surrender, Ascenders, something like that. And we ended up working together. And Lucas managed me for a few years when I was just starting out. But he taught me some of the most important things I could have been taught at that time. So he taught me how to write emails, how to work with people, what the required drive and work ethic was for the music industry. And I'm forever thankful for that. So thank you, Lucas, for everything. You set me up for success in my life, and I really appreciate it. And I'm honored that you were able to come back on the show and talk with me and catch me up with what you've been up to. Now, this episode, you know, it's a little bit shorter than the others. It's about 35-ish minutes, and that's okay. This episode covers Lucas's journey into the industry and what he kind of uses as his values to navigate the industry, which I think is is a very difficult part about the music industry. It's like, all right, who am I working with? What are they doing? Where are they coming from? What do they do? Now, Lucas is a manager for songwriters, as well as other things. His company does a lot. Look them up if you want. They're called Milk and Honey. But I think what's nice here is that when you are working with other people in the industry, at least for me, managers, agents, publicists, like in our past episodes, it's nice to know where they come from. It's nice to know what their goals are, how they work in this industry. That way you can understand how you can best work with them. And in addition to that, Lucas has just got some killer advice. So I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Don't Shit on the Bus. Before we go anywhere, thank you so much to all of our patrons for their contributions this month. We do have a new patron. Please welcome Jay to the Patreon. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. I will get you your welcome gift package soon. And I will see you on the Discord. All right. Thank you so much. Enjoy episode 65 with Lucas Keller of Milk and Honey. Hey, Lucas. How's it going? Welcome to the podcast. What's going on, Adam? Good to uh, good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you in your car. Are you coming? Are you going? Where are you headed? I'm, I'm, le- I'm leaving the office and... Uh headed back home. End of a very long day. Shorter than my usual 18-hour day, but pretty good, you know? 18 hours? When are you up and when are you asleep? What? I wake up at 7 in the morning. I work for an hour and hang out with my dogs. I work out from 8 to 9 a.m. uninterrupted. I'm in the office by 10. Office closes in L.A. at 7 p.m., but I, you know, I work pretty late, you know, Australia and Asia and sometimes late enough to hit the UK for a couple of phone calls, depending. Oh my God. So. Well, it's easy, not easy, but I'm sure it's effortless in an, I'm sure you enjoy it. You love to work. So, you know, an 18 hour day, you wouldn't have it any other way. Well, you know, it's like, they, they, they say, you know, they say to find what you love and then it doesn't feel like a job. So yes, you found that. And, you know, I like to start these podcasts. I kind of, most people I have on are people that I have known for a long time and, we interacted with each other at some point in our life, and for you and me, it was like almost 10 years ago. We haven't really talked in 10 years, and in that time, yeah. you created Milk and Honey, and yep. you found time to put cold brew on tap in your house. A lot of stuff happened. <laughs> My house is like ultimate bachelor pad. I believe that. Do you have any other examples of things that are at your house that would just blow my mind? I have like a walk-in cigar humidor. I have a... <laughs> giant wine cell all glass wine cellar putting it in infinity hot tub that water falls off the side of the hill uh you know giant outdoor shower i don't know a lot a lot of fun stuff i cannot wait to witness this in real life at some point that sounds amazing you did it you really did it Yeah. yeah dude that sounds amazing well i mean we go back a long time we had johnny minardi on here before you've come up in conversations before on the podcast when we met i was in high school and you were managing artists out of chicago but prior to that i know you went to college in oshkosh and then your love for music put you in a trajectory to become a manager what you know what caused you to become a manager early on in your career 
Well, I was, you know, so obviously you and I met because we're both Wisconsin guys and I, and I was, um, you know, yeah, go pack. And I was, um, you know, I, I started out just kind of like when I quit my band in 2002, I started just like, kind of like, you know, you know, at that time, you don't really know what's the difference between an agent, a manager, a record label guy, a yeah. publisher, et cetera. And so you just kind of get in where you fit in. So I started booking all my kind of favorite bands and then and my friends' bands, and then they all started getting record deals. And then I realized that like, I should probably just be a manager. And I read the Don Passman book, All You Need to Know About the Music Business, which I think everybody's read at some point in the business. And then somebody gave me a copy of David Geffen's The Operator, and it completely changed my life. And I just from there uh, was like, I'm going to be a manager and I'm going to move to LA at some point. I'm going to manage artists. And that kind of predated, you know, before my move to Chicago. But, you know, just was like, I want to be a manager. And I think I remember my like father talking about like growing up how, there's all these people that would do things for a few years and how everything is difficult to have real success. So people do things for a few years and there'd be people that had all these kind of like career changes throughout their lives and can never really make anything of any of it. And so I just had that in the back of my head and thought to myself, like, uh, and thought about that advice and thought, well, geez, this is difficult, but it's all really difficult. And, you know, my first decade and change of being a talent manager was, it was a slog. It was, it was hard. And, uh, and I learned a lot. Um, you know, it's like the people talk about the cliche 10,000 hours. I'd like try to round it up to like 200,000 hours. <laughs> and and I just, you know, I, I feel like I learned so much in those years. And but it really was about, you know, for me, like just head down perseverance, not changing career paths because being a manager was difficult. And later I kind of find my niche as a, you know, meeting kind of the American songwriter and record producer and realizing that's really my greater calling and advocating for creators and, and all of that, even more so than an artist manager. Yeah. I remember all the remains. It was, it, was, it, was, it was good vibes. I love all the remains. By the way, they're coming to LA and, and a friend of mine and I are going to go, go to the show just like old times. So That's going to be I haven't great. Been to, I haven't, I have not been to a metal show in a fortnight. Let me tell you. All right. I'll see you in the pit. There we go. <laughs> congrats on I, I I did look around on your socials and everything, and I just want to say congrats on your new personal best for working out. I thought that was cool. It's great. That, that's that's <laughs> hard. So congrats, and you know you're getting ready I'm, for the pit. I'm that's happy it about is. it. Every day, yeah, that's amazing. An hour every morning. That is the best way to start the day. Got a lot of cheddar cheese to work off. <laughs> that hits way closer to home than anybody else can understand. Cheese curds, cheddar cheese, and spotted cow. It's just all, all we know. New Glarus, Wisconsin, a lovely place. Yes. All right, cool. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep us moving here. You know, I know you moved from Chicago to L.A., and then once you were here, you, you continued managing a little bit, right? You were at the collective. You did kind of stayed in that yep. lane. And then eventually, like, while you're here, are you kind of just learning, researching, taking it all in, and then eventually, like you said, you kind of came to create Milk and Honey? Is that the vibe that was going on in your life? Yeah. I mean, so I got, I, I, when I got to the collective, I was uh, the first client I was given because that's how, that's how companies like that work. I just call them, it's like the Beverly Hills boardroom management companies. It's not the managers you and I grew up knowing about. It's, you know, these yeah. big kind of conglomerate management. I think at our height, we had 240 employees and the collective was like, you know, I was like the youngest guy in the music department and a guy who I'll forever kind of owe, and Chris Allen, who was managing the All-American Rejects at the time, had just left his company with Pat Magnarella, who was another guy who really stepped out for me and believed in me early on, and went to go start the music department at the Collective. And he, he was really responsible for bringing me in. I was managing a band that had just signed to Michael Goldstone called TV TV. That I remember them. Chris, that, that Chris loved. They're like the greatest band that never went anywhere. I mean, they're just, they were so great. They could have been the killers. It didn't happen, but this is a great business lesson, right? The one you think is going to happen might break your heart. So, you know, I get brought into this company and from there I start getting handed clients and I sign things and build a business. And but the first client is a songwriter named David Hodges, who had, who had come from the band Evanescence and had Ooh, gone yeah. on to, Nashville. to write some, yeah, gone on to write some big hits. He was living in LA at the time and uh, my boss came in and put a post-it note on my desk with his name and said, do you know who that is? I said, yeah, he's a big hit songwriter. 
I knew the songwriting world a bit because I had worked with Kevin Griffin from Better Than Ezra when I was at Uppercut in Chicago. And so yeah. I kind of knew that world a little bit. But I knew who David was from my, my rock days and, of course, knew Evanescence. And he says, yeah, he's a big hit songwriter. And the guy looks at me and he's like, son, we represent him now. And I don't know a goddamn thing about songwriters. Call him and introduce <laughs> yourself. And if he calls my cell phone again, you're fucking fired. And he walked out. <laughs> and so that was like the, it's what I kind of learned a lot about, like in Hollywood, like there's these guys that run companies and they bring in talent and then they kind of hand them off to the kid down the hall and they never talk to them again. And it's a really awful model that I've like made sure in my company, I don't, you know, just doesn't exist. You know, like I yeah. stay in people's lives. And if you're managed by the kid down the hall, you still talk to me. You're still managed by me. We, we manage by committee. So you don't ever just have one manager. There's just, there's a team, but okay. you know, but, but you know, with, um, you know, look with this, it was like, if you saw the opportunity, okay. Um, like, great. That's my client now. And if I run with it and I keep that client happy, like I'm his manager, because all yeah. you ever want to be is at that moment, you want to manage big talent. You want to not be the assistant. You want to be the manager. And so that company set me up to do that. And, you know, over, the course of four years there, I managed a ton of talent. I mean, these guys were, you know, Lincoln Park, Peter Gabriel, Kanye West, Slash from Guns N' Roses, Avenged Sevenfold. I mean, these guys were hitters and a yeah. company blew up and I just got to be around it and got to be on these teams and have a real seat at the table. So that was great. And I couldn't do Milk and Honey without that. And so later when I left and David came with me and some other people you know, I was still doing some artist management. You know, I had Scott Weiland from Stone Temple Pilots for a while. He came with me, some other people. I mean, I think even at that time, they breathed Carolina, a couple other things. <laughs> and, you know, I'm really going back here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I like but, it. But, I, but, I, but it just became very clear very fast, you know, those clients. I shed those clients and it just became about the songwriter. And David Hodges turned into my first guy. And then I signed another guy uh, named Sir Nolan, who we developed. Sir Nolan went on to be a big pop producer. And, you know, so the first hit I have in the company is uh, Christina Perry, A Thousand Years. And some sessions we put together, we knew she loved Twilight. And it was an opportunity for David and Christina to write a song for the film. And they write a vampire song called A Thousand Years. And, you know, it's a diamond <laughs> record now. And um, it's just a brilliant record that, you know, I've, I've just in the last... 10 years i've just had songs that have gone on to play at you know tons of my friends weddings and really amazing moments in people's lives i look at like you know james arthur say you won't let go which was one of mine or if you look at alessia cara scars you're beautiful which was this huge movement with females and the whole anti-body shaming thing and the anti-suicide movement like this it's just we've had these songs that have really sometimes when i forget about why i do this i just go on youtube and i look up our songs and I look up the covers and the stories and just kind of the furthest corners of the world that these songs have reached. And, and, it, and I, and I'm like instantly reminded of kind of the impact, you know, we're not curing cancer, but we're certainly helping facilitate art that impacts people's lives. So, so the second song we had, which was with Sir Nolan was, was uh, Nick Jonas jealous. And then not long after that, I had introduced him to a girl named Julia Michaels and they started dating for a while. And then along came Selena Gomez and Asa Brocky, Good For You, and, uh, you know, which was a song they were both on together. Um, that was, those were back-to-back -back number ones. And so, like, it's kind of like in your first year in business, you're like, oh, dear God, can I please have one hit to turn the lights on? <laughs> and then, like, the second year, there's more hits. And then the third year, we hit this great lick where, like, it just starts happening. And it's hit after hit after hit, and it's crazy, and it allows us to open more offices, hire more people and scale the Company's 28 people today. So it's, you know, it's pretty stepped up and, and it allows us to really, really grow. And, um, you know, one really fun note along the way on the Wisconsin story is, um, you know, my general manager who was my intern like nine years ago is a Burlington kid named Nick Warner. And <laughs> Nick is, you know, he made partner last year and he's a super, super important part of running milk and honey it's been cool to kind of start something independent with another guy from down the block and, and see the kind of success it's, it's had. So, um, that's, that's great. The only thing Nick and I promised to do is, uh, when we go home to our families for a couple of weeks over the holidays is, is not hang out with each other in Wisconsin. Cause usually we need a break <laughs> from each other. So,
but yeah, so that, that's kind of, so that's kind of the evolution. And later we get into artist management and we manage 25 DJs now and should have 12, 1300 shows this year if COVID sheds us any mercy. But you know, the real core is, uh, is built on on the song and the and and songwriters. I mean, it's congratulations. First of all, it sounds great. I it, I want to go back to when you left the collective and started Milk and Honey. And at the beginning, you're talking about you know your dad told you that things are difficult, they're rough. How did you decide that leaving the collective wasn't you you know giving up and it was more like all right i did my time here i learned what i needed to know now i need to do my own thing how does that look internally yeah so those guys like my boss in chicago was great to me steve Hutton, wonderful guy and jeff goldenberg and reza Zad and jordan burlant and all these guys in the collective were really good to me too i just think there's a defiance when you're coming up if you're a alpha dog and you're a leader of men and you uh, have opinions and you think you're right about them, even in your naivety, even in your naivety, you know, there's a lot of feeling like, Oh, I can do this on my own. And then when you leave, you realize quickly, like, Oh, maybe I can't, or maybe I made a mistake. <laughs> like, so like, the, you know, the unfortunate part is there's a lot of people in this town and out in the world that have this, this kind of bull, bullish confidence and, and don't really have the chops. And so Fortunately, I had enough of them and I had a lot of luck on my side too, but I've always been such a student of the greats and of the craft that I, I just had my head down and I, you know, did the work and, and didn't really rest on any laurels. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to go do my own thing and that's going to be really hard. So I think what I realized, I remember driving away from the collective, 83, 83 Wilshire and thinking to myself, oh my God, have I made a huge mistake? How will I ever compete with a company like that? And I remember, I remember having a, uh, lunch with a friend who was like a mentor to me who said, you know, you're not going to compete with them for right now. You're going to compete with the people that that company was not for. So some people don't want that size of a company. You know, people want something more boutique. And, you know, I think for, for us, that's really worked. And so my target has to be the people coming out of, out of that size of a company. Um, okay. not necessarily trying to compete with them. And so that's one thing that really stuck with me is that I'm not, my role should not be competing with those kinds of companies. It should be, Hey, you know, if you felt lost in the big system in Hollywood, we're a better option. And yeah. I was doing something different. I was targeting songwriters and record producers and not necessarily uh, frontline talent. Man, I really admire your kind of ability to transform, grow, learn, become, I don't know, just become better. And, you know, as you said in your email, your friend said, it's Lucas Keller who is always doing the most, which I think is, you know, just by the short, the few things we've heard from you, it's very evident that is true. But I mean, to keep doing everything you do at your company, leading this company, constantly finding new ways to change and evolve, do you have any I don't know, rules you live by, you've read a few books that things that change your life, rules you live by that really help guide you through this chaos, I guess you could say, because I don't know, you're, you're very successful. So <laughs> there's got to be something. I appreciate it. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, there's, there's a lot of rules, you know, like, you know, one is like, you know, I love that thing about uh, you see the same people on the way down that you see on the way up. And so, you know, just being about being good to people, you know, just our yeah. mantra. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the idea is like taking the high road, even in really difficult situations, we really have put talent first and never signed contracts with anyone. All of our deals with our talent are handshake deals, uh, which I'm oh, really wow. proud of. That's amazing. It's the best testament to our work. I've got a roster of people that can be represented by competitors and they're not leaving. We have almost yeah. no turnover in employees or clients. You know, we have all the same people from the beginning for the most part. I've never fired an employee. You know, we really just invest in relationships. So my whole mantra is LTR, long-term relationship. That's what I care about. Whatever the business terms may be, it's all about having long-term relationships because that is where I've been able to monetize the most and have, have the most success. I can't make that much money that, that I care about off of one hit with you. But if I can represent you for five years and plus plus, and we have multiple hits in your perennial success, that's interesting to me, you know? And the same thing goes for, you know, for all of the other relationships. So, and then as it relates to kind of mantra for life, 
look, I'm just a really blue collar still. I'm really big into staying in our clients' lives and doing the things that I did in the beginning. There's a lot of things I can't do anymore. I don't have the bandwidth to do like I used to, but I try to make sure that I do the things that count. And, you know, the clients all hear from me a lot. I've got all of the special days in the calendar, always checking in, gifting, all of the things that make them know like we care. And so I just think a lot of people, they get rich, but don't get fat. You know, it's like, I, to, in my opinion, it's, there's just too many people that stop doing the work. And yeah. uh, that's not interesting to me. I'm not building my company to sell it. I'm building it to make it bigger and make a lot more money. I, you know, I think a lot of people are in this for the wrong reason. I still love music. I still love records. And we want to build a great entertainment company and not to just flip it to a hedge fund, you know? So for me, my, you know, the mantra is really still about the work and the art and putting creators first. And um, it sounds altruistic, but I mean, I, I, I mean it. I feel like you injected Wisconsin into the music industry or like the Midwest <laughs> vibe. Like you like took what I like about working with people from the Midwest and you brought it to, you know, L.A., yeah, look, I'll tell you this. A lot of people have these stories about how shallow this town is and how there's no real relationships. And I, I just, I've established some great, you know, relationships in this town. You know, when I, when I sit down with people for lunch, I always do a personal and a professional check-in. I, you know, I just have so many relationships where I know, you know, where I'm in their life beyond just the business and not yeah. just our clients, all kinds of people. And I just think this town is so big on like, okay, we sit down to lunch, like what deal are we doing? Or why are we here? Or just so many people flexing their success. And at some point, it's just like, hey, you know, it gets it, that wears on me as I'm getting older. And I just think I still care about like the 4am night at the library. Like, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I, I really and it's, seriously, like over the pandemic, one of the things I started doing was selling publishing catalogs. It's an incredibly difficult process and lengthy and dramatic and something you have to really become an expert at because you're selling, you know, multi seven, eight, nine figure, you know, transactions. And it literally for me was like a return to the, the library, you know, the, the 4am nights and just like really becoming great. And I think that's the stuff I care about is just becoming, I want my company and my managers and, and for me to, to continue to become great you know, the success will follow. And we love, we love the success, but I think we're kind of guys that like, as a company, I have a lot of people that are understated in the way that, you know, we kind of walk out of the building, like, you know, we did it today and we'll do it again tomorrow. And it's, you know, it's the, the, the kind of fruits of our labor and the, and the byproduct of, of hard work. LA kind of wears me out like that because there's a lot of people that are just, they're not focused on becoming better. They're just in it for what can you do for me? And and I just, you know, the things I care about are like really great personal relationships with people. And then like, as it relates to our work, just becoming the best. Another thing from my father, you know, my father was a founding partner in the biggest architecture firm in Wisconsin. And at one point he left to go do something smaller. And I vividly remember, you know, he went to go do like a, into like into a 20 person company from a 200 person company. And, and I said, well, what, why? I didn't understand. And he said, because, you know, he said, you, once you do the biggest, your next focus is on being the best. And hmm. that to me is coming out of a big shop. That's my focus is, is building something that's the best. That's what I care about. Man, I love all this. This really embodies what the podcast is kind of about. And I, I was wondering, like when you're working with these people, whether it be client or hiring on people for your company, you said you focus on these long-term relationships and you're kind of, in my opinion, finding people that are in it for the right reasons, in it for the same reasons that you are and doing things that, you know, cultivate these passionate, honest, and ultimately long-term relationships. What do you look for in people, regardless of the work relationship that really represents somebody who does that? Because I'm sure you've turned people away or you said no to people. And we say, we say no way more than we say yes. I think what I look for is it's like the speed of trust. Like how quickly can I trust you? How quickly can I understand your moral character, your work ethic? How are you, how's it going to be when you, when things are rough and uh, when we're in the trough and we're not in the peak, you know, what are things going to be like? And I care about that so much more than like, oh yeah, he manages a big pop artist or he has like two hot songwriters and record producers. It's like, great. We have 
tons of hot songwriters and record producers. The, you know, first manager I ever met, 2001, said to me, uh, the bus comes every 15 minutes, another client gets off. I think he probably said another band gets off. Like, I used to keep a stack of, when CDs were still a thing, I used to keep a stack of all the jewel cases of all the records I put out. I've seen it. I remember this. <laughs> you remember it. And it's just like, clients come and go. Co- you know, now that I'm a sports department, I guess I would say, uh, you know, coaches outlast the players. And I don't speak about talent in a dismissive way because I'm of service to the talent. I, I was surrounded by a lot of people coming up that put themselves above the talent. And that ain't me. And I saw that. And I saw things, you know, as you see things that happen to you in life, you say, okay, that's a great lesson. Learning what not to do is so much yeah. more impactful when you see people growing up uh, or coming up in, in life uh, than, than what to do. You know, I think we just care a lot about ethics and we do short-term employment agreements. I don't lock people down for a long time. People keep renewing. That says the most about us is that people stick around. And so, yeah, the thing I look for the most in people really is just integrity and just, you know, and, and like I said, it kind of, you know, dovetails back into that, all of the conversations about long-term relationship. That's great. Well, I mean, it's nice to hear about everything you're doing professionally and how you choose to hire all these different people and who you choose to work with and the values you want to focus on. And when I was kind of looking through your Wikipedia, looking through all the information I could find in you online that wasn't your Facebook or something, uh, something else that stuck out to me was your support for, you know, you still find time with all this to support the LGBTQ community. You hosted yep. an event in 2019. What prompted that? Is there anything in your life that kind of, you know, I feel like if you take time to do something, it has to be important because you're so busy. Like, how do you find time for this? And I don't really have a real question here. I just wanted to kind of understand more of what you do there. So, so uh, I came out at 27 and then Billboard put me on there like LGBTQ power executive, you know, power 100 or power executives list. And our publicist said, do you want to do this? And I said, I don't think so. I don't. I don't know if I care. And she said, no, I think you should do this. I said, I don't really lead into that. And she's like, well, she's like, I think you should do it. So I did it. And then all of my friends called me and I realized I'd never come out to the business. I'd come out to friends, <laughs> but not to the business. So after that, I started doing more of that stuff. And, you know, I talked to Out Magazine and I talked to Variety and I talked to all kinds of, you know, Billboard when they do the Pride Summit. And I think my thing is, for whatever reason, I didn't have a lot of discrimination coming up in the business. And the reason is, I guess nobody would have guessed I was gay and nobody, uh, and, and, and because nobody knew the, the truth is I, I didn't have any discrimination and that's not the story for many, many people, you know, talent, executives, et cetera, you know, kind of the lack of LGBTQ, uh, artists, you know, in the community and the opportunities for them. I just like to bring, uh, people together in that world. So yeah, so we do variety and I do this thing out to brunch every year. We did it up until the pandemic. We'll do it again this year. And, and so I'm, I'm passionate about that community. I'm most passionate about what I do for creators and for a living and for writers, producers, artists, and athletes. But, uh, but, it, but it's an important part of the story. You know, people like say stuff to me that I don't really like. I have like a hard time connecting with, but they'll say like, your success as a gay guy from the Midwest that had no family or connection to the entertainment business helps advance possibility for people in that community that could be in the music business and, and be successful in Hollywood. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot. Okay. I mean, I guess <laughs> true, but it's something that I take seriously. So I'm, I, I care a lot about that community and giving back where I can. Well, I think it's great that you find time to help other people out, not only business wise, but it like, that's awesome. I, I, I don't really have much to say other than I thought it was very cool. And it, you know, it speaks to your character and just the thanks. I'm not, a part of that community exclusively, but I think it's important to help people that, you know, have less opportunities or it's harder for them. And it's nice to see people like you doing that. I don't know. I like that. Well, cool. I yeah. mean, Lucas, that pretty much sums up everything I had for you today. And, you know, I think we're perfect on time here. We do have one last question for you, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Of this is, you know, this podcast was started on touring. So I know, and I know you've been in a band and worked with bands. So you're going to know this question, even if you've never experienced it. But if you were to tour, in this day and age, shower shoes or no shower shoes? What are you doing on the road? Shower shoes for sure. My father used to go <laughs> to the, well, it's everything about my dad here. My, my father used to go, I was so way too Hollywood to have ever done this, but uh, uh, my father used to go work out at the YMCA 
and he didn't wear shower shoes and got staph infection, almost lost his leg over it. So, oh my God. Um, yeah, like athlete's foot and staph infection, whatever. So always shower shoes. And uh, if we're learning after a pandemic, there's dangerous germs out there. Uh, <laughs> but by the way, I'll tell you, you know, not I don't really go on tour much anymore. Like I'll fly in for a, a New York or a London show or L.A. show I'll go out to. But um, most of our DJs, it's, it's all air travel, you know, so there's yeah. no buses. But um, it's so different from like when you and I are hanging out. It's like this world is Vegas and Ibiza, and Miami and, you know, in London. And it's just such a different kind of. You know, we're not going from, uh, you know, Kansas City to Dallas, you know, <laughs> that often. But uh, it's funny because, you know, I, I feel like a great advantage to artists where they kind of like look at me like I've been some studio rat for a long time, just hanging out with record producers. And I'm like, man, I've been at a Walmart parking lot at four in the morning on a tour bus in every city in America. Like, like, try me on my knowledge. Of You've lived it. The country. So I've lived it. Like, I always love that kind of season in life and kind of seeing the country and the world that way. But everybody should say yes to shower shoes. All right. Well, damn, we got that. We have to we have some work to go back and do, Connor. We got to let people know to update their decision here, myself included, because <laughs> there's a lot of no shower shoes or shower shoers that come on here. By the way, to the name of your podcast, the answer is yes, shit on the bus. Just make enough money to pay for it. <laughs> this do you just pull the whole snoop dog like i'm gonna smoke weed in the venue i'm just gonna pay the fines before we get there kind of vibe it just 100 like, okay cool well thanks lucas so much for your time have a good rest of your day yeah enjoy, my pleasure enjoy your trip and uh as much as you can and i uh, look forward to hearing from you when you get back thanks again yeah man. man yeah let's get together we'll grab a drink it'll be great easy sounds good take care good to meet you connor take care, take care.